There's no doubt that the kind and diversity of animals on rangelands is is amazing and it's really quite a butt of the allure of rangeland. So today in Rangeland Principles, we're going to talk about animals. There would be a lot of different ways to categorize animals as we think about them, um, but today we're just going to focus on these five categories. Mammals, birds, herps, which includes amphibians and reptiles, uh, fish and insects. Let's not forget insects. They're highly important. So let's take a look at some of these. Before we dig in, let's uh, make sure that we're all on the same page when we talk about how our relationships as, as humans has evolved with animals. First of all, let's talk about wild animals. Those are ones that exist in their natural state. We might call them wildlife, such as wild mammals, birds, fish, herps, and don't forget insects are highly important on rangelands. If we as humans have had a strong influence on animals and we've altered their genetics and their form, that would be called domestic. So domestic animals have become not only accustomed to humans, but we have controlled and, and modified them. And those would include livestock, cows, sheep, goats, horses, pigs, and pets, cats and dogs, etc. Then finally, feral animals is a unique group of animals that were once domesticated, or they have been influenced by humans, but they've been reverted, they've reverted to their natural state, such as in the US, we have wild pigs and wild horses. Two other terms important is where an animal came from. Native animals originated where they now occur. They're living without the help of humans. So in in the U.S. we would say something is native if it was native to North America. That's important because it indicates that that animal is adapted to the local climate, the soils, to other animals and microbes, etc. If an animal came to where it's living now from some other place, so it, it kind of evolved or, or became accustomed to another place and it was brought here, that would be called introduced or exotic. They could be introduced by humans uh, they could also come over um, just by accident and, and were accidentally introduced. And this would include feral animals. Those would be introduced animals. And next, before we dig into it, let's think about uh, categorizing animals based on what they eat. Of course, we've talked about this before. Herbivores eat plants, grazers and browsers. Carnivores eat meats. Um, they search, they hunt, they consume animals. And then omnivores are like us. We um, are meat eaters and plant eaters. So think about herbivores, the grazers and browsers on rangelands. The, the thing that's unique about them is that they can ferment cellulose. Remember, cellulose is that compound in plants that is not digestible by mammalian systems, but many mammals have created a relationship with microbes in their gut, and it gives them ability to digest cellulose. Those would include deer, elk, rabbits, sheep, cows, horses, etc. They get their energy actually from the microbes that break down the cellulose. So that means they can eat grass, forbs, shrubs, trees. They have pretty wide variety as long as it's a herbaceous thing they can use it. There can also be herbivores that don't digest cellulose but they actually um, find the compounds on the range that don't have much cellulose in them. Those would be called concentrate selectors. Um, they include birds, small rodents, mice, etc. And what they do is they just search the, the environment for the simple carbohydrates, the starches and the sugars, and they break those down. So that means that they eat mostly roots, berries, seeds, young shoots. Birds, even as large as emus and ostriches, um, they don't digest a lot of cellulose, but their system is such that they can break apart the, the plant cells enough so that they can get those soluble parts. Carnivores, of course, are those that they don't digest cellulose, so they get their protein and their everything they need by eating other animals. So those would include wolves, coyotes, foxes, mountain lions, etc. in rangelands. They get their nutrients from what we call preformed compounds, i.e. meat. Um, they can eat, they, most of their digestion is, is simple, but their the strategy of trying to find what they eat is difficult, searching, hunting, and uh, and finding a way to consume those other animals. And of course, omnivores are those that eat both plants and animals, and, and we belong to that group along with bears and pigs and a few others. Um, we get our energy mostly from high quality plants, but also by eating animals. Um, we do not have the ability to digest cellulose. We have a small relationship with some microbes in our gut that might give us some energy from cellulose, but mostly we have to eat really high quality soluble starches and sugars and other animals. 
Now let's start down that list of the five major types of animals that we're going to look at, and let's start with mammals. Okay, mammals are the group that include us, of course, and they're mostly unique because they have mammary glands, or they have the ability to produce milk. Also, interestingly, they ha we have hair. Other groups of animals don't, and we have the ability to uh, make faces. We have facial muscles. But those are our main differences from other animals. A particular term among mammals that's very important is the term ungulates, because many ungulates are grazing animals. Uh, so those include anything that has a hoof, so hooved animals, cows, horses, elk, deer, etc. And there's two kinds of ungulates. Some have odd toes. Those would include like animals with one or three, so the horses, tapers, rhinoceroses. The even-toed ungulates would be cattle, pig, horses, camels, etc. So keep that term ungulates in mind. Birds are another type of animal that's very important on rangelands, and they include animals that have hollow bones, they lay eggs, and they have feathers, of course, but also they have no teeth, so they have to find a different way to harvest. We often don't think of, of amphibians uh, like salamanders uh, as range animals, but they do occur in range ecosystems, and they must lay their eggs in wet or moist environments, so along streams and along seeps. Uh, they have smooth skin, and very few of them are herbivores. They're mostly carnivores or omnivores. And of course, because rangelands are dry ecosystems, reptiles are very important because they evolved to, to um, live on dry ecosystems. They have dry scales that hold the moisture in their body. Interestingly, they have very poor hearing, and they rely on vibration, so they often say that if you're trying to avoid snakes, you should stomp on the ground because that vibration is important. Many reptiles never need to eat drink to drink water. They get all their water simply from the food that they eat. On rangelands, if you work in the riparian area and stream management, you're going to need to know a lot about fishes. We won't study it a bunch in this class, but fishes are unique because they have swim bladders to keep them in the water, up in the water. Of course, they have gills to breathe, and uh, they're interesting because they are were the first animals to have bony skele skeletons. So. Those are some unique things about fish. Insects are super important on rangelands. They're, they're the greatest herbivore. More than mammals and others are the insects that are, are eating plants one small bite at a time. They're unique because they have exoskeletons. They do lay eggs. They Many of them have wings and they have six legs. They outnumber humans a thousand to one, so they're very abundant in ecosystems. The ones that we'll talk about most would be uh, grasshoppers, uh, Mormon crickets, and then some pollinators such as moths and butterflies. Next, I'm just going to go through a host of animals that we're going to use as examples in class. So this will just be a brief overview of some animals that are important uh, on rangelands. Deer are really important herbivores on rangeland. Um, they are arguably the most important game species in the lower 48, and hunting provides much recreation enjoyment for many people in the U.S. They're native, they're herbivores, they're wild, and they're ungulates because they have hooves, of course. The ones that we'll talk about most are mule deer and white-tailed deer. Uh, they can be distinguished by the type of antlers they have. Generally, mule deer, like the one in this picture, have, have kind of branched antlers that kind of keep branching as they go out, whereas um, white-tailed deer have sort of a main branch. But that's not the main difference. Uh, more likely, you better look at for the white tail on white tailed deer and then some of the facial markings. Pronghorn or pronghorn antelope are also very common on rangelands because they really like the wide open space, so they like to see their predators before they arrive. They're native, they're herbivores, they're wild, they're ungulates because they have hoofed feet. Uh, interestingly, they're not really antelope, they're more closely related to giraffes than antelope. So I prefer the, the term pronghorn. They're very fast because they apparently evolved in North America when we had really fast a predator such as a cheetah, a North American cheetah that used to exist. Bighorn sheep are also interesting and important herbivores. They are native and wild ungulates on North America. There's a problem in that there's a conflict in disease transmission between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep. Uh, domestic sheep carry a type of pneumonia that when bighorn sheep get it, it's deadly to the bighorn sheep. The domestic sheep are just carriers. Bighorn are a game animal, and they can have, like this uh, um, buck in this picture, really heavy um, horns, up to 30 pounds. 
Bison are native herbivores, ungulates, that once roamed across the West, and they were brought nearly to extinction when the railroad came through. They were hunted for their hides primarily. Uh, now there are several wildlife refuges, including Yellowstone, where there are fairly large populations of bison. And they are interesting because they are in the same genus as domestic cattle, and they can even hybridize with cattle. There's also some issues with disease transmission between cattle and bison, including brucellosis. Beaver are native wild herbivores. They're really important to manage streams and rivers. They, during the exploration and settlement, they were hunted and trapped, um, and drastically re decreasing the number of animals. They were used because their um, their skin is water repellent, of course, since they live in the water. And then, then they have a compound in some glands called castorium. And castor was used for medicines, perfumes, food flavoring. It was an interesting compound. And because of those two things and, and their meat and others, they, uh, they really were hunted nearly to extinction. They are the largest rodent on earth, weighing about 50 pounds. Black bears are common on ranges, especially at that uh, range forest border. They're omnivores, they're wild. They can live up to 25 years, so they're pretty long lived. Uh, they can be pretty timid and don't usually attack humans. It's very uncommon that humans would be killed from black bears. Of course, they're called black bears, but there are some versions that are red or brown and sometimes called cinnamon bears. So that color of their hide of their fur can change quite a bit. Red foxes are a native carnivore that have really beautiful hide and they were historically really trapped and hunted for that hide to get a fur coat. Um, that's not so much so common now. They are really important on rangelands because along with coyotes, they um, really reduce the rodent population because that's their main prey. They're known as mesocarnivores, like skunks and martens and other small carnivores. That term is called mesocarnivore. An example of a large carnivore, a mega carnivore, would be a wolf. They're native and they're wild, and they were extirpated from the lower 48 uh, states. And about 1960 would have been the, sort of the last sighting of a lot of wolves. They were reintroduced in the 1990s, and now they've become so their reintroduction was so successful that they've become a game species in several states, including Idaho. Cattle, of course, are domestic animals that were introduced to North America. They're ungulates and herbivores. Um, there's kind of two groups of cattle. Some are called the taurine cattle. Those would be the those that came from European background. The cattle would include um, Angus and Hereford, such as those in this picture. Another group of cattle are called zebu or boss indicus. They came from the African continent and would include Brahmins. I'm kind of hedging here because the actual genetics of cattle is still under debate. So I'm going to kind of group them into those two types. They were first brought to North America by the Spanish explorers, and the longhorns that we see today are descendants of those first cattle. Sheep are also domestic livestock that were introduced. In this case, they evolved in Asia and were introduced to the U.S. You can see from the map they're found largely in the West and in Texas, so those mountain uh, areas of the West is where we might find sheep. Uh, they're interesting because they have a split lip unlike cattle and they're able to really be more selective in their feeding and because they're a prey animal they also need to see all around them and they can see nearly 300 degrees around their head without turning their head. Horses were also introduced to North America. They're herbivores and ungulates. There was a native a variety or a species of horse that became extinct long before uh, humans, uh, western humans came here and so the Spanish brought in the 16th century, they brought horses here, and uh, some of those horses became feral, so some are still domestic, and some became feral and have existed ever since. Uh, the feral horses are managed on federal land, such as the horse management areas that are described in this map. Sage grouse are large ground nesting birds that occur on rangelands are also game birds. They're sagebrush obligate species. So on the map, you see that purple area that they arranged all across that sage. They really require sage, especially in the winter. Um, over the years, their population has uh, declined steadily. They have been proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act several times. At, at this current time, they are not uh, listed as endangered. They are omnivores, they, uh, especially the very young chicks require insects in those first few weeks of life. 
um, but then later on they will eat forbs and sagebrush. Burrowing owls are an interesting bird on rangelands. They're native and they're carnivores, but they're interesting because, first of all, they're awake during the day, unlike most owls. They um, hide in burrows, not on nests on trees. And it's said that they, when they're in a burrow, um, they make a sound like rattlesnake to deter predators. We find them a lot in um, prairie dog towns using those burrows. Feral cats and other animals that will go down in burrows can be quite a threat to these species, and they are in decline across the West. Perhaps the most common bird flying on rangelands would be the red-tailed hawk. They're native, they're carnivores, they're wild, and they are federally protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act because they do um, fly from fairly high northern areas to um, all the way south. They kill and eat their predators up to twice their weight, so they can really t have a, a profound impact on uh, rodents and snakes. And also they're popular um, for people to tr use in falconry to train, and so they can be tamed and trained. Chucker are a small uh, ground-dwelling bird that are important game species. They were introduced to North America they are wild, but they are omnivores. They were brought here from Southeast Asia, and they're beautiful little critters. They're um, most closely related to the rock partridge or other kinds of partridges. Interestingly, they're the native bird of Iraq, and we um, hunt them on rangelands in very rocky kind of uh, canyon grasslands and canyon areas. An interesting amphibian that grows on, on rangelands is the Columbia spotted frog. It's native, it's an omnivore, and it's wild. And it's interesting because it was um, petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act for nearly 22 years on and off, and then it was removed as a candidate in 2015, largely in collaboration with landowners and conservationists who developed ponds and uh, protected wetlands, oftentimes stock tanks and other things. So it's apparent that Columbia spotted frogs and cattle and ranching can live, you know, in harmony with each other. If you've worked out on rangelands much, you may have come across one of these um, little lizards, the horned lizard. They're very interesting critters. There are uh, quite a few varieties from the Mississippi River west. Uh, they eat mostly ants, and they're interesting because they can really flatten down if you pick them up. And then also some are even able to squirt a blood out of their eyes as a chemical deterrent. One of the most feared reptiles on rangelands are rattlesnakes. They're native, they're carnivores, they're wild. And uh, there's several species of, ra of rattlesnakes in the West. This map here is of Western rattlesnakes. And some are more likely to strike or are more aggressive than others. The diamondback, the Western diamondback, is known as a very aggressive species. They are venomous, but not all bites include venom. In, in fact, in some cases, only one in 10 bites might include venom. So if you're struck, stay calm. Uh, try to get to help. Uh, none of the venom, like sucking out the venom or making uh, strikes on your leg, that is never recommended. Just stay cool, stay calm, get to help. Uh, realizing that mm, perhaps the bite doesn't even include venom. Here's kind of a scary thought. Uh, the females give birth to live snakes as much as 25 young at a time. An important fish species occurring on streams and rivers on rangelands is the bull trout. It's native, it's carnivorous and wild. It's federally protected under the Endangered Species Act and if it occurs on rangelands it can cause conflicts between recreation and ranching because streams need to be protected for the species. There's two strains and this is one interesting thing. One strain of bull trouts are resident and they don't migrate. Another strain is anadromous and that means they live a while on fresh streams and then they go to the ocean and return to the fresh streams to spawn. So that term anadromous is important and salmon and bull trout are both species on rangelands that are anadromous. There are a lot of kinds of bees that are important on rangelands. The mason bee is perhaps the most widespread. It occurs in nearly every state in the Union. They're native, they're herbivores, they're wild. They're really important as um, pollinators, both on rangelands and um, moving into agricultural systems. They're called mason bees because they use mud and other masonry products to construct their nests. So they're kind of little masons that create their nests out of mud and rocks. 
Grasshoppers are very important herbivores on rangeland. They're native and they're wild and they're prolific across the globe. There's many species in North America. One of the oldest forms of chewing insects, meaning that they don't get their um, energy from plants by digesting cellulose, they get it by breaking up the cells and uh, letting the cell contents of starches and other compounds out of the contents, which they can digest. Because they have this feeding strategy, they can eat a third to a half of their body weight per day. So they can have a huge impact and be large grazers on rangelands. In the really dry areas of rangelands, you'll see harvester ants. They get all their moisture they need from the seeds that they eat. They're native, they're herbivores, they're wild. And um, they are called harvester ants because they harvest the seeds and they put them underground in these little granaries. They sort of pack seeds into small cavities in their um, homes underground. That makes them important for seeds dispersal and in some cases seed protection because they're eating mostly forbs in this case. Um, the stored seeds often germinate and grow and so therefore they're sometimes called agricultural ants. So there you have it, a quick overview of rangeland animals with some of the interesting and unique features of them.